Today's video is sponsored by Clean My Mac X, your Mac as good as new. Hey, it's Chris, and today I'm gonna be unboxing the brand new 13-inch MacBook Pro with that new M1 chip inside. So in this video, I'm gonna be giving you some facts about this amazing new machine. Of course, I'm gonna be doing some real-world testing. I'm gonna be mentioning things like limitations and downsides because there are some for pro people who are considering this laptop that's called a MacBook Pro. And man, I've been using that 16 inch MacBook Pro for so long, I forgot how much I like this size, 13 inches. Now along the way, I'm also gonna try to provide you with some context in terms of how this thing fits into Apple's overall lineup. Now of course, this does have the new M1 chip in it, which makes it very similar to the newly released MacBook Air, which is between $250 and $300 less than this MacBook Pro, depending on the configuration that you get. And actually, this MacBook Pro here is the first Apple device that has Apple Silicon inside that has active cooling. In other words, a fan. Because of course, iPads and iPhones have been running on Apple's chips for years now. So something you're really gonna wanna ask yourself is what does having a fan, that active cooling, do for this particular computer? And here's the rub. Having active cooling, AKA a fan, in this particular computer will allow it to sustain performance over long periods of time. And that is something that actually could and will appeal to pro users. And then of course the speakers in all MacBook Pros are absolutely phenomenal and I would a thousand percent miss them if I opted to get the Air instead of the Pro. The touch bar is here on the 13 inch MacBook Pro. Some people love it, some people hate it. I tend to like it, at least not mind it. And I made a whole video about how to make it extra useful to yourself. So it's worth checking out if this is something that you're gonna be buying. And then of course, versus the last 13 inch MacBook Pro that was Intel powered, we have a better keyboard now. It's not the butterfly mechanism, very nice to use. And the performance and battery life are massive upgrades. And since I'm actually just doing an unboxing here and some initial tests, and sort of talking about what this means, I'm not gonna have a chance to test that battery life in this video. But needless to say, I'm not sure if the battery life improvement, which is huge, is gonna be the biggest deal for people, or whether the crazy performance gains are gonna be the biggest deal, or frankly, in the future, when iPad apps can be run on this device, if that is going to be the biggest deal for people shopping for this computer. In fact, all three of those things just sound amazing, don't they, when I say them out loud? So this is a big deal. In fact, unboxing this, to me, feels a little bit historic. I'm gonna go up to the About This Mac window, and I'm gonna notice something very interesting. See if you can spot it yourself. This says nothing about the chip's clock speed. So we're looking for a number that says something like 2.5 gigahertz, something like that. That's not here. All it says is chip, Apple M1. So we have to actually turn to some benchmark utilities and the scores that people have posted to see that this computer actually clocks in somewhere around 3.2 gigahertz. Okay, so I've got some 8K footage that I'm gonna drop into Final Cut Pro here, and we're gonna see how the timeline scrubs and what the preview looks like, and we're gonna do an export and see how fast that works. Now, quick little primer, I don't know if you're a video editor or not, but within Final Cut Pro, which is a professional app, you can go in and you can select better quality or better performance for the footage that you're editing for the preview. And if you select better performance, it's gonna kind of dumb down the quality so that you can edit a little bit faster without your machine slowing down. If you have an older machine that can't just handle everything at full tilt. So I'm gonna see the optimized media playback and I'm gonna select better quality. So it's firing on all cylinders now. And when I scrub through this 8K timeline, I'm not seeing any stuttering or dropped frames. Uh, it's not pixelated. It looks incredibly clear. And my mind is a little bit blown right now because I'm somebody who's used to editing 100-bit uh, footage from a bunch of Sony cameras and a multi-cam timeline all together at once, and I often, on my 16-inch MacBook Pro, have to either create proxies for my footage, which creates smaller file sizes and previews so that I can edit that footage without having any issues, and that is not needed here for this 8K footage, even though this is the 13-inch MacBook Pro, not the 16-inch beast. It's very smooth. I know it's kind of hyperbole. You just hear it everywhere. People are like, this is smooth as butter. But this is buttery, buttery, buttery 
smooth. It's the optimized original. It's not even proxy content. You have to remember here, what's happening is Apple is controlling the core component of this computer, its chip. And all the hardware, that full hardware stack, all the software, so Final Cut Pro is an Apple app. So from top to bottom, Apple has optimized everything to work really well like this. Now, if I stuck this same footage in Adobe Premiere, I really don't think it would handle nearly as well and be nearly as smooth. Now, what I usually do in my workflow is export in H.264 for a really high quality, good looking piece of content, but that takes up a lot less space. But for this test, I'm gonna export the source uh, ProRes 422 and see how long that takes. So this is a 43 second clip. I'm timing it right now to see how long it takes. It's just been a couple of seconds. It's already 20% done. You probably already know what to expect. You've heard all the reviewers saying this is amazing and I think we're only gonna have that confirmed right now. Okay, so it wrapped up there in a minute and 24 seconds about. Pretty incredible. I'll insert a voiceover here when I'm editing this to let you know how long that same file took to export on my 16 inch MacBook Pro. Go. Okay, so I just ran the same export test on my 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro with a 2.4 gigahertz, eight core Intel processor and 64 gigabytes of memory. And this not very old, basically fully maxed out 16 inch MacBook Pro is actually 10 seconds slower with this 8K export than the 13 inch MacBook Pro. So wow, this 13 inch with the M1 is incredibly impressive, especially for the price. I should add too, I didn't even have this thing plugged in to a power source. That can give you better performance in these types of situations where the computer's under really heavy load. Some things get switched on and off. I wanted to do it uh, without the power plugged in just to give us an idea of maybe a, a real world usage scenario where you're not in the office and you're out, you're either at class or traveling, uh, you're mobile and you still have to get your work done. Now, I don't just wanna tell you the mics are really nice in here. Let's do an actual little demo here. So I've got a file here with some acoustic guitar, with some vocals, with some percussion and everything in this file was recorded using the internal mics on this 13 inch MacBook Pro. does actually sound really good here in person. Not sure what it's gonna sound like coming through uh, the mic setup here. If you had just played this for me and didn't tell me that it was recorded on here, I maybe wouldn't have thought, it wouldn't even have entered my brain, the thought that this was recorded on a laptop with built-in mics. I would definitely have thought that there was some kind of external mic setup going on here. To me, in person, the sound was rich, the vocals were crisp, I could really hear the shaker coming through. This actually is really impressive. I know most reviews are not gonna focus on this, but somebody can go out and purchase this computer without an external mic and record something that sounds really, really great and kick off their music career. Not to mention how beneficial these mics are gonna be for your Zoom calls and your FaceTime meetings, right? Okay, so something that I wanna test is this new Retina screen. It's slightly improved over what you guys have seen in the past with the 13 inch lineup. You know, Apple's display technology has always been very impressive. And in this photo here, wow, I can make out so many details in the rocks. It does look gorgeous. In this particular sample, we're looking at a photo that has some light and dark areas. And in the dark areas, I'm definitely able to make out some detail, which is great. I can see all the details of little spikes and spines. And the dark parts of this photo actually really recede. You can see in the top left-hand corner here, I can barely, 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 barely make out the edge 
of where the picture stops and the bezel starts because the black and the black. As somebody who uses Photoshop all the time to edit my thumbnails, for instance, would I appreciate this level of detail and the colors? Yes. With the public release of macOS Big Sur, it's a good idea to be prepared for any potential issues that may come along with the release of a major new version. Clean My Mac 10 is a simple, friendly, all-in-one cleaning and optimizing utility that can handle these issues and help you clean up your Mac's performance. With this app, you can stay on top of app permissions. You can use the smart scan to clear log files and user cache that's no longer needed. And you can run a malware check in just a couple of seconds. And you may especially love the optimization feature, which is a straightforward way to handle performance draining processes. Yep, Clean My Mac does exactly what it sounds like. So if your computer, like mine, is starting to get a little bit slow, then why don't you give it a try? Use the link down in the description and pick up your own copy today. All right, so look, at this point, you've heard a million people saying all the great things about this M1 chip and these new M1 powered computers. I wanna spend a minute just pointing out some of the circumstances in which a pro person, a pro user, since this is the MacBook Pro and it's marketed towards pro users, may not be the best choice. Well, here's something. When you go to configure one of these, you might notice that you can't get more than 16 gigabytes of RAM in any of the 13 inch configurations. All right, the average person isn't gonna need 16 gigs of RAM, I understand. But if you're a pro, more RAM generally means that you can load more apps at once and load bigger apps without having to wait for data to load and process. Also, you're not gonna be expanding the memory on this thing. Once you buy it, it's set. So if you were hoping to get this now for a cheaper price and then upgrade it over time, that's not something that you're gonna be doing. And that's actually not just because of the storage. You will never ever be able to plug in an eGPU with this 13 inch MacBook Pro. It's just not compatible. So again, you buy it and you get the capabilities that it has when you buy it, and that's not really gonna change over the lifetime of this product. Is it a very, very, very capable machine right now? Yeah, it absolutely is, and it's probably gonna be pretty future-proof for a lot of people in their workflows, to be honest. But still, doesn't it feel just a little bit weird saying, hey, in the future, I'm not gonna be able to use an eGPU even if I want to? Yeah. If you're a pro Apple user, then you may want to plug in multiple external displays. Right? But with this, you're only gonna be able to power one external display. That's just the way the cookie crumbles here. Now, is that the biggest complaint in the world? No. But what if you already had two displays that you've already purchased and you wanted to plug this in and, and daisy chain and use both and really maximize your desktop setup? Well, you're kinda out of luck in that regard. Now, for the past year and a half or so, I personally have been using an LG 49 inch super ultra wide monitor. And honestly, that might not be a bad way to go, a super ultra wide for this because it's gonna give you effectively two 27 inch displays side by side without any kind of bezel in the middle. On the other hand, is anybody really gonna be complaining if they can only plug their Pro Display XDR into this, for instance? No. I mean, that's an amazing experience. Now, one thing that I find almost offensive for a pro Mac is a 720p webcam. Still, in 2020, almost 2021. I'm really not sure why Apple didn't at least upgrade the webcam to 1080p. What they did do is kind of borrow some iPhone processing tricks to enhance that 720p image, but still, it's 720p. There's only so much you can do. And at the end of the day, I'd rather have the enhanced version of this 720p webcam than not, but 720p, come on. I mean, even the iPads have 1080p in some of them. Let's go. So we have this new chip. One thing that's kind of disappointing is that we only have two ports on this smaller 13 inch model. And in addition to that, we don't have any kind of SD card reader or card reader at all here. This is a pro device. That means I'm still gonna have to plug in some kind of a dongle to help my workflow out. Something else that could have been cool here would be the addition of a 5G option so that you could have cellular connectivity here and not have to rely on a wireless internet connection. That's something that I would like to see and something that could help differentiate this from say the MacBook Air. And while we're talking about differentiation, you have to remember in the iPad lineup, the iPad Pro has Face ID and other iPads don't. I feel like putting that M1 chip in the MacBook Pro here would have been the perfect opportunity for Apple to include Face ID. So those are at least a few things 
that could be pointed out that might make some people who would call themselves a pro think twice before actually ordering the 13 inch MacBook Pro here. So what do you know? This is not a perfect miracle machine, but who would have expected that? It is gonna be probably close to perfect for some people, but again, not for everybody. Okay, so at the end of the day, who should buy this? Should you buy it? Battery life, so much better. Performance, so much better than what we had before. The ability to run iPad apps eventually, that's amazing, really opens up the possibilities for you. All in a nice and compact 13 inch design with active cooling, AKA a fan for longer periods of sustained performance with this amazing new M1 chip. If you consider yourself a pro, and I think you probably know who you are, <laughs> and if you're wondering, then you probably aren't, and that's okay. I know a lot of pros who are going to use the new MacBook Air because that's all that they need for their type of profession. So that's great, whatever works for you. But if you're a pro, and you're gonna be doing, let's say, some heavy video editing, like me, and you're looking for a portable package that you can also set up at your desk and turn it into a bigger experience, with a big monitor, etc., one big monitor, then there's a lot to like here, but you have to ask yourself, do the downsides that we've been over in the previous segment matter to you and your workflow? I have a feeling that for a lot of people, the gains that you're gonna get with this M1 chip in terms of performance and more sustained performance with the active cooling and the battery life enhancement, in this price point, that's probably gonna outweigh things like only being able to use one monitor, not having an SD card slot and having to put in a dongle, not having face ID, only being able to configure with 16 gigs of RAM, no possible storage expansion in the future, and yes, even that 720p webcam. I think that there are a lot of coders and designers and video editors and photographers who will enjoy this machine to the fullest and be very happy that they bought it. I also think there's another bucket of people, probably like myself, if I was shopping for a new computer right now and I had the luxury of having a machine that would get me through for another year or year and a half, because you have to keep in mind, this is gonna be a two year total transition from Intel to the M1 across Apple's Mac lineup. If I had that luxury of just waiting a little bit, I probably would because I'm super, super interested because of this device, because of the new Mac Mini, because of that MacBook Air, to see what the a little bit bigger, more powerful Macs are gonna be able to do with Apple Silicon inside. I'm talking about the iMac Pro, and I'm talking about the 16 inch MacBook Pro. I can't wait to see what those are gonna look like and perform like with Apple Silicon inside. So, I mean, like always, if you need something now, then buy this now, if you think it's gonna be good enough for you. I've been watching people talk on Twitter, and there's a lot of people who are selling their 16 inch MacBook Pro that they just bought last year that has an Intel chip inside and they're getting the Mac mini and they're getting even the MacBook Air or this MacBook Pro because this is capable enough for what they're doing. These are crazy stories. This chip is so powerful. It's just kind of driving a revolution, I think. So there you go. This thing is indeed amazing. Uh, it does feel like the future has arrived in the past's body. <laughs> but I think that's gonna do it for this video. So thank you guys for hanging out, for watching. Let me know what questions you have down in the description and I will catch up with you in the next video or podcast. You should be following at Daily Tech, spelled Daily T-E-K-K on Instagram and Twitter and probably check out our podcast too. It's for your own good. It's the Daily Tech After Party, it comes out Fridays. It's all linked up down below. Later.